Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to tonight's uh, call for the uh, fourth month. This is Lev Mekudash, which is the renewed heart. And so tonight we're going to be talking about the fourth biblical he Hebrew month, which is the month of Tammuz. So I'm excited to um, get started this next couple of months um, are like kind of packed full with like a lot of things. And it's uh, the heat of the summer we're going to be talking about and um, just all the things that kind of go with that um, in a spiritual sense. Um, you know, when you think in the agricultural, uh, what's going on right now, like it, for a lot of us, it's really hot, except for our friend Katrina, who is freezing down in Australia. Um, but for the rest of us, we're um, up here and, and we're getting 80, 90, um, plus degrees uh, weather. So um, so this is a time where we begin to really have to pay attention to um, our, our, um, our plants and our produce and things like that. Like we have to keep up on those things or things are gonna wilt and die. So it takes care and um, we have to keep watch over those things. And that's what we're gonna be discussing tonight. So. Um, if you are ready, I am ready, and we're going to share a screen and get started. I just got a message to make sure I had done it. Nope. Okay. I'm going to minimize you guys, just as every, every time I always say it. Um, if you need me, just holler because I can't see you. And I'm gonna have to, I forgot to take my slide set. I was going all the way back through it. There we go. Okay, we're gonna open up in prayer. This is the blessing over the month. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who gives us the new moon, the sign of being born from above and continual renewal. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who renews his mercies every morning and gives us countless opportunities to repent and start fresh. May the ancient light of your moon's face never cease from reminding us of your truth, your love, and your saving grace. Father, um, we pray that you would renew the fourth month unto us and to your people, the house of Israel, for life and for peace and gladness and joy, for salvation and consolation, for a good livelihood and sustenance, for good reports and tidings, for rains in their season, for complete healing and swift redemption. Father, we just pray that our eyes would be open and our ears would hear what it is that you need us um, to gain this day, Father. I pray that you would just be in every aspect of this meeting and call tonight, Father. Um, just give me the words that you have given the message, Father, of your fourth month. And I also pray, Father, that you would just be with the technology. I pray for those who are hearing the message now and hearing the message later that there would be something that would just speak to them and, um, and just transform because that's what our time with you is all about, is transformation. We love you and praise you. Hallelujah and amen. So I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight. Um, for Lev Mekudesh, the renewed heart. Um, I think uh, just the few names that I saw, I think most of it you have been with me already. But just in case, I want to let you know that there are downloads. If you go on to your cafe calls into this call, if you go to the eighth month, which was Heshbon, it's so we actually started at eight. We did not start at one. Um, so go to the Heshbon call, and there are a lot of downloads there. Um, it has our resource sheet. It has our snapshot, our months at a snapshot, um, which has got like all twelve months on one page. It's got um, and, and just like a snippet of like the things that um, are their attributes, like the tribe, the sense, the letter, and so those things are there. There's also um, like a note-taking sheet um, that kind of has all the categories. I don't always hit every single one of those categories, but sometimes I hit them like in different ways. So I don't just go straight down the list um, always, but, um, but yeah, so that's just something. And you can look them up on your own too, if for some reason I miss it. And of course, we know that our main basis is um, Keisha's book, um, The Biblical New Moon. And I'm actually going to be reading um, a snippet of uh, Keisha's PDF from 
um, her biblical new moon for the fourth month of, uh, of Tammuz tonight. So we'll do that later. So if you go in, usually our assembly, that's part of like what we do, like our group that meets um, for our new moon. So the week ahead of time, um, myself or Rhonda will send out maybe Christine Vallis's video for the month that we're on and also um, Keisha's video um, that she has done. But if you go to graceandtora.net and you go to under her new moons tab and you go down to any of her videos really, but if you go to Tammuz, um, then you will see the PDF of her notes on there that she graciously puts on there. So good. Um, so you can get all of those notes. Um, and she goes in depth in, in depth, like Keisha does, um, on a maybe more things than like what I hit. Cause I take a lot of resources and put them in here. So you guys kind of get a broad spectrum and she might really hone in on one thing, like about Ruben or the connections, like the connections that she makes are really great. And then, um, she'll also have other articles that maybe are linked to the month. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you to make sure, um, again, graceandtora.net, like a great resource for just about anything that you could want to um, learn in the, the Hebraic roots or biblical learning. Great stuff there, but it definitely um, my go-to source for the new moons. Okay, so here we go. We have the fourth month, month of Tammuz. Um, and so we're going to be talking about our walls. Um, uh, are we shoring them up? Are we repairing them? Are we checking them out? Are we keeping watch on the wall? Um, we've got idolatry we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about valleys and kind of that squeezing that's going on during this month. And then vision is a really big thing. We're going to be, um, you know, everything that we do, the aspects that we are going to be looking at, it's all going to be encompassing um, about that vision that we have, uh, the spiritual eyes, are we using our lenses, the world's lenses, um, or the lens of the Father? So we're going to go ahead and talk about kind of the elephant in the room. If you're not used to, or you haven't, um, maybe if you're not used to like knowing the names of the Hebrew months, a lot of them aren't even um, like necessarily Hebraic words. They might be, because it's all kind of the same language, they might be um, close to um, other um, Semitic languages, I think is what the Middle Eastern languages are called. I'm not a linguist. So, but I think those in the, the Arabic and Hebrew and different languages um, were like Semitic languages. And so they have connections. But I remember a couple years ago when we were doing our new moon study at the assembly, I said, you know, we started it and I said, this is the month of Tammuz. And one of the ladies stopped and said, wait, you know, there is a month um, called Tammuz. And of course, that really um, kind of puts a bad taste in your mouth if you have studied things about some of the pagan holidays. And if we see in the Bible, um, it's mentioned um, about the weeping of Tammuz, which I think actually we talk about later on the video. Um, but there is um, some reason for it. And one of the things I want to bring up is actually in our Torah portions for this month, I think it's in Hukat, where they're grumbling and complaining and um, fiery serpents, um, I don't know if it's fiery serpents, serpent, <laughs> but serpents come out and, excuse me, and um, they begin to bite the people and the people are dying. So Moses, he, what does he do? He creates the the bronze um, pole and he puts the serpent on there. He holds it up. And what do they have to do? They have to look at their sin to be healed. And that's kind of what this month is all about, is that introspection. Are we looking in? Um, are we looking around to see what the enemy is trying to do? Are we looking out with critical eyes? That's another thing. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of that, but the reason that um, it seems to be in the writings of like the Hebrew sages and, and the rabbis is that they kept it. They did not change the name or they, they intentionally changed or intentionally left it Tammuz or called it Tammuz is because they wanted to remember where their idolatry put them and their idolatry put them into exile and it destroyed destroyed their temple 
And so those are, so I know it leaves a bad taste. And personally, the only, um, so I don't mind saying it and like, you know, I don't like to just like throw out names of, you know, pagan deities or whatever, but I know they have no power over me. Um, but one of the things I don't do is that when I pray the blessing over um, the fourth month, I don't use the name. I just say the fourth month. So that is one place where I'm praying to Yahweh. I don't, I don't uh, put that name in there, but that's just, that's for me. I don't judge anyone on any other, how they would want to do that. But um, Tammuz was kind of known, we'll go on from that now. Tammuz was known as um, kind of the fertility and agricultural um, uh, God. So a sprout of life is what they connect his name to um, in uh, the Babylonian, it might be a, like an Akkadian language, and the Babylonian language um, is sprout of life. And so really, though, when you think about this month and what's going on, um, we are beginning to see, well, not beginning, we're now like um, into it, right, that the, the corn is growing, the soybeans, your tomatoes, your flowers, those things, they're, they have sprouted up, they're, you're seeing life. And now is when we have to begin to tend to tend to them because it's hot. Um, and it's that hot, it's parched, the land gets super dry. Um, we, I was about to water my flower bed, which was very neglected last week. Um, some of my lilies were starting to brown on the edge. And that night we got a good soaker. So I was praising Yahweh because I did not have to go out and get my, um, my water, my um, flower beds that the next day. So in the month of Tammuz, um, there's a lot of things that happened. And like I said, this month and next month begin kind of a really big focus um, spiritually and in just like the um, Israel's history on those things. And looking at like, okay, why did these things happen and the consequences that happened? And again, we keep those in front of us, not to um, cause us shame, not to keep us in guilt, but so that we can make sure that those things aren't happening again. That's how we keep our walls strong. And so traditionally, it said that the golden calf was created and destroyed. So remember, um, at Shavuot, we just got through awesome Shavuot. And, um, and then... We've had a, like that, that high, like, a, you know, we were talking to our king and, and he was speaking to us and telling us what he, you know, these are the things, you know, I have for you. And then we're saying, you know, we will do all that you, you need us to do. You want us to do. Um, and then we begin this fear and this doubt, um, uh, begins to set in place. And so they were worried. They were like, where's Moses? We don't know what's happened to him. Our leader is gone. And so then they created the golden calf. And then it was in uh, Tammuz when then um, uh, Moses would come down the mountain, uh, broke the tablets. So we'll talk about this. I think I have it later, but just in case I don't mention it, I do want to say that there is a um, uh, fast on the 17th of Tammuz. Um, now on my calendar that falls on the Shabbat, um, I think it's actually on the 16th um, would be for me, the 16th of July would be the 17th of Tammuz. And so uh, this one is a sunrise to sunset. And because it's on Shabbat, um, we don't do a uh, fast on Shabbat. Um, and so it would be on Sunday. Now this is not commanded. And I will, I do talk about it later about the, the different um, fasts that's mentioned in Ezekiel, but I tend, I have tried to keep them the last couple of years as I've been doing the calendar and recognizing the calendar because it really just um, gives me just an extra like um, intention and mindfulness um, and prayer focus. So during the, that um, fast, my prayer focus is about the walls that are being breached because this is also the time that the walls of Jerusalem are breached by Nebuchadnezzar. And then, um, and so then the spies are sent out to check out the land. And so there's a lot of things that are coming up that are um, not always the best in Israel's history, 
biblically and even in their more, more modern history, the things that happened between Tammuz and Av. And so um, this is kind of a time to take notice of like world events that are going on and maybe even the things that you're seeing around you, um, even just within your family. Uh, so just keep notice of those things because this just tends to be that time. And I don't know, but you know, um, sometimes when things get really hot, uh, things, people begin to act up. Um, I think you just get ir more irritated when you're just hot. Have you, you had that? Like your, your house is hot or your car is hot and you're just like, don't touch me. I don't want to be around you. Um, I work in a prison and we really like the hot months are really like the ones we don't like because they all like they want they want to be cool and their housing units are not. And so they're hot, they're irritable. Um, and then they, that comes out on us and we take it out on that, you know, so it's just like all of the stuff that goes on. So you just see during the summer months where those personality things, um, and, um, uh, just those thing kind of things just like bubble up to the surface, they boil and fester and kind of like sometimes explosions can happen in that. Um, so again, it's not like, um, you know, future telling that this is going to happen because that's why we pray into those things. And we recognize like, why am I acting this way? Uh, what is it that's going on that's causing me to um, fester up, um, you know, to my husband or to my kids or to my coworkers or, or my parents, whatever it may be, um, you know, what's behind that. And we're paying attention to that. So I just have my little timeline here of Nisan to Tammuz, where we are. Um, Nisan, we left Egypt. Yar, we're in transition out to Sinai. That was our thought life. Uh, Savan um, arrives. We arrive at Sinai and we stay there for a year. And then um, while they were there, Tammuz, uh, Moses ascends and the golden calf is created. Um, and this is uh, our vision um, are, uh, we're going to be talking about sight and vision first since this now. Okay, so our themes, testing through heat, authority issues come up this month. And if you think about where we are in our Torah portions, if you're familiar, if you've gone through those a couple times and you know um, where we're at in the story, we're in the wilderness and it's constant um, authority issues. We saw that um, with Miriam and Aaron, uh, was that two ago? And then this one, um, last one with the spies. And then it just kind of keeps continuing through the remainder of this um, this tour, this month. So all four tour portions, we'll kind of talk about that. Um, sight, uh, are we seeing giants or are we seeing grapes? So that's something to ask ourselves. We're going to talk about that a little later too. And idolatry, idolatry consequences. So remember we talked about the bronze serpent. Um, what that, and that wasn't for idolatry, except that maybe their fear and their doubt was their idolatry because it wasn't necessarily um, the golden calf, which I, I personally, when I see the golden calf, that rooted again out of their fear and doubt. Um, and so they put their trust into a man-made idol. And then repairs of the breaches, which is like my favorite part of the month of Tammuz. When I first did my first round of studying the Hebrew months, this was just so significant and spoke to me so much. And I just remember the prayers. Um, I think you can even find prayers through um, uh, what we'll be calling the three weeks. And Keisha has a article on that too and I'll be talking about a little later, but uh, repairs of the breach, Isaiah 58, 12, love, love, love the scripture. And one of those that would be great to um, have um, memorized, your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets or paths um, to dwell in or to live in. And that word repairer is gadar. I have it down there at the bottom of my screen if you're seeing, if you're watching and listening. Um, but it's gadar, and that's the Strong's 1443. And it means to wall in or around, 
to fence or hedge up. That's kind of one of our themes too. Um, make a wall or a mason. And so I just um, thought that picture of not only looking around for ourselves, for our walls, but it says um, you raise up the foundations of many generations. And so sometimes we're repairing breaches in our own personal walls and our family walls that have been there for a long time. And those are some of the hardest because maybe they're um, uh, lower, <laughs> like right. You think if you build on the wall, um, my husband has a beautiful visual. I don't know if he actually did it in a message. I know him and I have talked about it, but the idea of um, a building being your faith and, and how, you know, we build things, uh, whether it's um, faith, whether it's fear, whether it's doubt, like we just were talking about. And so there's sometimes you've got to take some of those out. You have to take them out and repair a whole part of the wall because this section is crumbling in doubt and fear and anger and resentment or addiction, um, whatever it may be. Uh, those things have to be knocked down, pulled out. It's already crumbling. Um, so we have to get in there and do the work to repair it. And not only for us, but for the generations. And so that there were generations before, and there's going to be generations. We want to build that strong foundation for the generations that are coming up. We don't want them um, trying to lean on or be protected by a wall that's um, crumbling. It, that's not going to work for them. And so we have to start looking that in that direction. We're, we have to start looking forward to that. Um, and we just, I was talking about before with Shava O, we just had like this beautiful appointment date um, with the king, our groom. And now the enemy wants in and we have to be vigilant. So we have to um, kind of like, we can't keep the party going. <laughs> you know, we have to be those watchers on the wall. Okay. And he sets those watchers um, out there number. I put the number and letter. I don't have a ton of stuff on these two. I think uh, a lot of us are very familiar with that, but the number four, the four, we're in the fourth month, that's authority, government, dominion. And when we think about our authority issues, um, you can see how that kind of correlates with that. We have four corners, uh, four horns on the altar, uh, seats seat on the four corners of your, the four cornered garment, seat seats. Um, and then the four rivers, the four horsemen. Um, so we see that four in a lot of things because it has to do with that dominion and government and authority over, um, over like our lives, over the people. And then of course, Dalet is the door, the threshold. And that really just flows right into what we're talking about with our walls and our gates. And our letter is the het, the eighth letter. Um, and so the meaning is life. And if you will, high them. And um, so that huh word that lots of times in English, they just put an H on. So like Hanukkah is really a, a het. Um, so it's Hanukkah. Um, and so the pictograph was the fence or wall. Um, and so we see all of those kind of connections working together um, in this month. So he's trying to really get the message across to us. And I just love how that flows out that, um, you know, Yahweh not in the Bible did not say, okay, put this letter with this month and put this, you know, he didn't do that. Um, it kind of flew, flowed out of um, different things. And how beautiful is it that the letter Het is for um, this fourth month and it just flows so beautiful. And it's about new beginnings. So when we're tearing down that wall we were just talking about and we're repairing the new so that the enemy can't get in, um, we've got some new beginnings that are starting there. Beautiful picture. And so our four corner fortress wall of protection can come under attack from the enemy. So we need to be vigilant and we have got to keep our eyes open. So remember, this is the month that the walls of Jerusalem were breached. Traditionally, the Jews say that the first temple was destroyed because of idolatry. They allowed a breach by giving in to lust of the eyes, 
the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Um, you know, a lot of us base, a lot of our decisions are based on feelings and not necessarily the truth. And so, um, you know, when things are going on in the moment, it's hard for us to make those good decisions. Our tribe is uh, Reuben, um, which is behold a son. So we have our connection to our sense, which is sight. Um, and, uh, and so Reuben is the firstborn of Jacob and Leah. Leah sold his mandrakes for a night um, with Jacob. If you remember that story, actually, when we did Yar, um, Issachar uh, was born out of that. And so I really kind of find it interesting um, that Reuben is connected with these mandrakes because mandrakes were, I guess, um, known for fertility, um, aphrodisiacs. So a connection to idolatry and lust. And so we have um, Reuben who, um, you know, it, we're here in this month and we're talking a lot about idolatry. And so then we see later in Genesis 35 that Reuben sleeps with his father's concubine, Bilhah. And is this just strictly out of lust? Is this to get back at him because his mother has been rejected? Keisha has a really good um, um, part of this in her article on this month. Um, so this lust and sexual immorality stayed with him until the end of Jacob's life. Because in Genesis 49, it is blessing that says Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruit of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. However, <laughs> unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed and then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So here's Reuben, um, you know, all of the promise, all of the, um, uh, you know, the hope, right, in the firstborn. And he says, you, pre, you preeminent dignity and power, but you lost that. You lost that dignity and power because of um, your unstableness, that the unstable, I think that word is like boil, fester. It's like that, like, you know, um, a boiling water and bubbling up. And, and, and what does that do when it's bubbling? It's kind of can pop out on you too. And so uh, he was he was not fit to hold um, that firstborn spot. And then we go on with his life where Moses says, let Reuben live and not die, nor his men be few. So this is at the end of their time, um, at the very end before they go in. So there's no reference to his past. And even Moses had seen with the rebellion of Korah that there were Reubenites that joined in with Korah because he was a firstborn. So why can't I be in that firstborn? You know, he, again, when we listen to the negativity, when we're in that environment and we begin to fester together, um, that's what happens. He convinced his brothers to put Joseph in the pit instead of killing him. He went first, uh, when they got to the land, um, they went in first, uh, in, um, to take back the land, but they settled on the east side of the Jordan. So they were known as warriors. One of David's mighty men um, was a Reubenite, at least one of them. And, but they also were the first to go in captivity. So Reuben isn't really much different than the rest of us, right? He had his ups and he has his downs. And we see that with all the tribes. But, um, but I, I think we see um, a lot of lessons learned through his um, his life. So uh, be aware uh, of being ruled by your unstable and boiling emotions. Um, the muzzle, move my bar here out of the way. The muzzle uh, for the month or the constellation is Cancer or sar Sartan, Sartom, Sartan. I don't know how they would say that, which means a crab. It's kind of like the word like for circular. Um, so the traditional way to look at cancer is about the hard outer shell 
um, hard hearts, right? That maybe that's the first thing you think of, like a hard heart. Um, we need to have um, a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone, and getting that um, changed, like we see in Ezekiel, becoming vulnerable before the Holy One. But I want to talk about another possibility because every Thing else around this constellation has absolutely nothing nothing to do with a crab. Um, there is no like it just to me doesn't even make sense. And so I I get the like spiritual implication of like the hard outer shell being vulnerable before Yahweh. But then I happen to read um, in one of the books um, it just mentioned like they also say that it could be a sheepfold. Well, last month we talked a lot about the more ancient um, constellation pictures. Um, you know, how some of the more modern ones aren't the same as what they were as older. Well, what I have found when I look at everything else, and you'll see as I go through these, that the to me, the better possibility is that um, it's a sheepfold. The Egyptian name for this constellation is called Claria, Claria, the folds or the resting places. The Syriac name, which is probably where it came from, Sartono, is the one who holds, which I can see like the, the clambers, you know. So I think um, in the Zodiac book that I use, he talks about um, the kind of the spiritual lesson of holding on, you know, to, to Yeshua or Yeshua holding on to us and not letting go. So I can get that, you know, but, um, but for me, um, the one who holds, I can almost see that sheep pen, the sheep, a sheep fold would be a sheep pen. Um, I can see that, um, the one who holds, he's holding in the pen, his sheep, um, his loved ones. Um, the stars in this one are tegmin which means sheltering or a hiding place. So again, I can think of that hedge or wall of protection. Um, I don't know if we've talked about it in here, but um, so one of the things that they used to do, like we've seen the rock walls that they make, like, you know, um, I don't, I'm guessing they probably did them um, in uh, Israel, but I know you see them a lot in England and Ireland, Scotland, where they have sheep. Um, they have the rock walls, but another thing that they used to do is plant um, acacia bushes around them. Um, it's like hedge balls, like if you, um, they, they go by different names, um, uh, hedge apple, um, they're like the green unedible balls as far as I know is the fruit that comes off of it, but they can be thorny, um, a very hard wood. And they would plant those in a circle or a square, I don't know. And um, they would leave an opening and that's where, um, that's where the uh, uh, sh uh, shepherd would sit. And so those had been known to be planted and you would find those out in the, the wilderness. Um, another of the stars is al Himarain, which means lambs or kids and ma alaf, which means assembled thousands. So again, I keep seeing a sheepfold and that's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> so um, if you get other, um, uh, you know, revelation about this, you know, please share with me, but I'm sticking with it. And another reason I'm gonna stick with it is because of the minor constellations that are in the sky. If I can get my slides to move. Let's see. There we go. So the other uh, um, the other ones are uh, Ursa Minor, which is the little bear. Uh, but there's no bears in the ancient uh, picture pictures of the constellations. That's more modern picture. Um, and again, but the more ancient is the sheepfold. So it's like the sheepfold just kind of continued over um, from the main constellation. Uh, the stars are dub dubhe, which is a herd of animals, but it's also similar to the Hebrew word dab, which means bear. So you can kind of see where maybe that bear came in to play at some point. Um, kohab, which means waiting him who cometh. And then we also have 
uh, in Ursa Minor, we have Polaris, which is the North Star. And this will take us back to our, um, our sense of sight. It's that center of attention. Our eyes are focused, and that's what the, um, you know, the, they navigate. Um, like if you're on the water or you're out, like that's kind of the focus. Every, all the other constellations seems to spin around this North Star. And then, of course, we have Ursa Major, the Great Bear, also known as the Big Dipper. I was just looking at it the other night. And it's considered the greater sheepfold. So again, I'm sticking with sheepfold. Um, the stars in it are Maroc, the Flock or Purchased, uh, Fokhtov, that's a hard one to say, uh, <laughs> Visited or Numbered, so numbering the sheep. We know that happens. They get an accounting. Um, other stars, Redeemed, Ransomed, and again, Sheepfold. And then the last icon um, in this constellation group is Argo, the ship. And I did mention that before. Um, Argo, there's um, Greek mythology that has to do with carrying Jason to receive the golden fleece. Um, and there's a whole story and it's really kind of like um, a messiah type story. So we know that a lot of the mythological stories um, mimic um, like what our messiah, who our messiah is. Um, and Argo was said to have a lion head on um, the bow. And when I was getting ready for this, usually something comes up that like really, you know, I'm, like he gives it to me like right at the right time. And he did that this morning. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to read something because it was just so, so, um, just a beautiful picture. So I hope you'll um, enjoy it too. So this is from a Facebook post that um, the author Tessa Afshar, some of you may know her books, Pearl in the Sand, Harvester Rubies, um, uh, Thief of Corinth. Um, I love her. She's she's great. I think I've read pretty much all of her books. She's wonderful. And she does biblical history. Um, so she had talked about going to like one of those living history museums. It was like for like the um, 17 and 1800s in America. And so her and her husband were there and this is what she wrote. Um, so they were by a place, they had lambs at this farm. And it says one of the lambs managed to run out of the enclosure, becoming separated from its mother and other sheep. I noticed the shepherd merely walked alongside it and did not force it back inside. I asked him if he intended to pick the lamb up and return him to the pen. To my surprise, the shepherd said he preferred not to force the lamb inside, but to allow him to roam until he was tired of being outside and wanted to return to the fold himself. Of course, he stayed close to the lamb the whole time he was wandering, and if he seemed to be running too far, the shepherd would gently block his way, forcing him to stay close enough so that he would not be utterly lost. I watched the shepherd for a long time. I watched to his patience and gentleness with that lamb and thought, this is how our good shepherd is with us, the combination of protection and freedom. Something happens to the lamb when he's allowed to roam free. He learns to trust in his shepherd. He learns uh, to yearn for his home and the security of his pen. If you've been wondering if someone you love has the security of God's borders, just know that Yeshua is near. He is watchful and there is a purpose to this season. So I just, I saw that story this morning and I'm like, Father, how perfect is that for this month? Um, when we're talking about walls, hedges, protection, our good shepherd, the sheepfold, he's, it, that's what, that's what this cycle and circle that we're on is all about, that the wandering and the lost, he's trying to bring us in, but he's doing it in a way where we're learning to trust him and we come in on his own. And then sometimes we're on the inside and we're watching that with our loved ones. And I imagine that that's probably more of the case with the group of ladies that I'm here with tonight. We're watching those that we love who are kind of wandering and lost and trying to find their way. And we have to trust that we know the Good Shepherd is right there, kind of guiding all the stops along the way. So I just wanted to share that with you. I loved it. Our gate for the month is the valley gate. So if 
you've been with us, you know, we started out with the sheep gate and the sun. Again, here we are with the sheep gate. And we talked about the good shepherd that month and the sacrificial lamb that got us to the fish gate where we talked about being fishers of men. We talked about, um, you know, when we become disciples ourselves, we have to sit at the old gate. That is um, where we get counseled um, and we're learning discernment. And then we get to the valley gate. And I, when I think of valley gate, the first thing I think of is the valley of decision. If you remember the um, Mount of Blessings and the Mount of Curses, and they're yelling and the other, the re everybody else is down below and they're, uh, they, so it's that valley of decision. What am I going to pick? Blessings or curses? Um, it, there's three valleys outside of Jerusalem, but most agree that this valley um, was the Valley of Hanom. So where it's placed, so this Valley of Hanom is toward like the south um, east, I guess, because this gate, um, Reuben, um, would begin the next set of tribes that are on the, we started at the east and now we're down at the south side of Jerusalem, or well, where the gate would be in the south side, but when we think about the tabernacle and the way they were laid out and where they were positioned would be the south side. Um, so the Valley of Hanom or Gehenna is probably some more um, recognizable to us. In Jeremiah's time, it was associated with Moloch worship, which is basically sacrificing of uh, the children. Later, there that's where they burnt the trash and the corpses of criminals. So um, you can imagine uh, not a lot of people wanted to go through the Valley Gate. It's probably a place that they kind of stayed away from. Um, if this would, if this would be historically accurate. Um, it probably wasn't used a lot except for workers who were doing this kind of work. The people, if you look at Nehemiah, uh, the people who worked on it, there's not too many people named, but one is Hanun, favored. And then the it just says the inhabitants of Zenoa, which means rejected. And I was thinking about that favored and rejected. And I thought about, you know, Find, us finding favor in Yahweh's eyes and I think about the rejected that he's again bringing those who feel rejected who he's bringing into the sheepfold just were some of the things that um, I got when I was looking at those two um, names and the valley are where things grow so I remember I don't know 25 years ago I was on the summer ministry stream and I had a friend who said to me like at that time the most profound thing we were talking about, you know, we were working with youth groups and camps and stuff when we were talking about, you know, you have that mountain high when you go to camp and what do you do when you get back to school and back to your families. And my friend said, um, don't forget, there's not a whole lot that grows on the mountaintop. <laughs> you may be way high up there and see beautiful things, but everything you're seeing is what grows lush in the valley. And I was like, that's so profound. Like we have to go through those valleys but we also have to look at what kind of valley it is, what is growing out of it. Because if you're on the mountaintop, and remember we had that um, blessings and curses, and you know, those blessings can um, rain down and uh, it's raining into the valley because we're remembering his promises, we're holding on to his promises, we're living out his word in obedience, even in the tough times, the squeezing times. And I just thought, you know, that living water is coming from the top of the mountain. Well, what about that mountain um, of, of curses? What is running down from there? And I'm thinking of the yuck <laughs> that's running down into the valley. And in that valley, you've got death and disease and destruction. Um, so what's growing out of that? You know, it, like if you've seen those pictures of the kids who work in, you know, the the trash heaps um, just to, to get any money whatsoever and the disease that's prevalent there. Like that is not the valley we wanna be in. We wanna be in his lush valley, but we know that there's gonna be times where we may have to traverse and get over and get through or pour, you know, help pulling people out of that other type of valley. Um, so in the third month is where we sought good counsel and now's the time to see how we use it valley of decision. Um, I hope you guys can see this. I have my bars over top of it, so I don't know if you're seeing the full screen. I hope you're seeing the full screen. I have to, 
gosh. Okay. So within the Straits or Ben Hametzer, uh, Ben Hametzer, <laughs> I can say Hametzerin, Hametzerin. Oh my gosh, guys. Tongue tied. Ben Hametzerin. There we go. Within the Straits. So um, if you do go to gracentory.net, this is part of this is from the article that Keisha wrote. So between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av, um, traditionally has been called um, uh, the three weeks or um, between the straits. Um, and so if we talked about the fast day on the 17th, and then um, that's a sunrise to sunset. And then in the um, 9th of Av, there's also one. So those fast days in Zechariah 8, 19, it says the fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and 10th months shall become joyful and glad. So that's where we kind of get an inkling about, um, you know, if you're reading those, you're like, what are these fast days? And, and traditionally, there have been these fast days um, to um, commemorate or remember certain things and to pray into those things so they, they don't happen again. And that's kind of, like I said before, what I, what I see it as, what I use it for. So I've kind of made my straights here. We have our big lump of coal um, that we've pulled out. Um, it goes through the straights. It's getting pressurized. Remember, we're talking about the heat and pressure that we're going through. And what comes out of that is a beautiful diamond. Um, Judah's gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. The road to Zion mourn because no one comes to set feast. Uh, and that's interesting. They mourn because no one's coming to the set feast. So part of our repairing of the breach is to tell people about the set feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh, her virgins afflicted, and she is in bitterness. But then we learn in Zechariah that those fast days, which are usually for mourning, they will be joyful and glad because the people will be coming up to Mount Zion for his feast. Hallelujah. And just the idea that just being a part of that, um, like what a humble place to be that all of us get a chance just to live it out and obey it and just share with people what a blessing it is to, to keep his feast and to recognize, remember, and to guard um, his feast days and his Sabbath days. Our sense for the month um, is sight. And um, our vision is determining our path this month. And that's Jeremiah 616. A lot of us probably know and love that one. Thus says Adonai, stand in the road and look. So we're using our sight. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we won't walk in it. So I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the shofar. But they said, we won't listen. So here we are. Um, I, I feel like we're, we're all being put in that position of being um, watchmen on the walls. You know, we repaired the breach and now we're on the walls and we're calling people. That was um, Zebulon and Issachar the last two months. Uh, we talked about um, calling to... Um, the people to the mountain. And so, you know, he's, he's given us a job to do and we do it with love and tender and gentleness and compassion. Um, the spies were sent out in the month of Tammuz. Um, so do we see Anakim, the giants, or Anavim, grace? So how clever of Yahweh that those two things are almost identical. And all really it's just a flip of the switch you know what are what are we seeing when we go into the land you know when it says that we can see land that eats its inhabitants do we see that as um it's going to eat us or do we see it as what the father said i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to clear the way for you and lots of times i think we see it as we're going to get eaten we're going to it, the land is going to take us over. The situation is too much. And he says, it's not too much. I've cleared the way. 
Like, trust me, trust me, little lamb, I've got you. Um, weeping eyes, um, when we talk about Tammuz, there's that, um, the verse in, I got it there, Ezekiel 8, 13 and 15, that talks about, he says, what do you see? And there were women weeping for, for Tammuz. And, you know, tears, we need to, we need tears, right? They, they are productive to clear our eyes. But what happens when we don't get them dried? Our, then we're always going to have blurry vision. We're not going to be able to see. We can't drive. We can't function if it's always, if we're always crying, if we're always weeping. Uh, there's a time and a place is what Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes tells us. There's a time for everything. And there's a time where it's time to put it away. The father says, I am here. I, I have wept with you. I've held you. And now I've picked you up. And you need to start moving forward and you need to, to continue on. You cannot be the victim anymore. And that's so important to recognize that. And, and so, you know, it's there for a moment. You, you take it for, you take those tears, you, you take that cleansing and, you know, allow it to do what it needs to do, but then recognize that you can't stay in that spot. Some of our other considerations are the medotes, which are characteristics. We have truth and honor and long suffering, which is patience. Um, and doesn't it take truth to see clearly, to make those tough decisions and maybe some tears to get the dirt out? <laughs> uh, showing honor this month to those in authority is something to evaluate if we're doing. So again, that authority issue may be um, maybe our authority is being challenged, but maybe we are challenging other people's authority. And maybe if it's not even out loud, it's in our mind. Like, I cannot believe that he's in charge of this. I can't believe the decision that he made. I can't, you know, like we allow those kind of thoughts to go on in our head. And that's eventually going to manifest into something um, in the physical, whether it's something we say to that person or the way that we treat them, not showing them honor. Moses prays on behalf of the Israelites over and over because of a, being a leader, showing traits of long suffering. Now, we also know that he also broke tablets and he struck the rock. <laughs> we see that in the, um, in the, the Torah portions. Um, but for the most part, he was a man who was on his knees for the people of Israel and he was um, interceding on their behalf. The Torah portions um, uh, will be coming up, and I know you guys will be reading those. We got Korah, um, Korach, which has the head in it, by the way, and uh, Hukat, which is about authority um, and complaining, uh, Balak, honoring Yah's people, uh, because we know that Balaam could not curse the people. He's working even when we can't see. And then that also brings in that Torah portion brings up lust of the eyes um, when they committed um, idolatry and immorality uh, um, uh, with the Moab, Moab, Moabites, I believe, women. And so, um, so yeah, so those that again, that theme of idolatry, um, the authority, uh, who has the authority of our hearts, right? Um, and then Pinhas, uh, one of the favorites. See, these are like some of the favorite um, Torah portions, I think, for a lot of people. There's just a lot going on. Um, and, you know, when you're in the book of like Leviticus and Numbers, and we know, I think we're learning to appreciate and, and love those books for what they are. Um, and, but when we get to the book of Numbers and we've got some more of the, like the story portions, I th think that's really something that, um, kind of really, um, I don't want to necessarily say fun to read, but just, um, exciting to read, I guess, because we, there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of there. And so being zealous for Yah, um, and in that having a covenant of peace and our, is that who, who we are, you know, um, do we want to be known as bringing peace? So the organ for this month is the right hand. Um, and so we know that the symbol of righteousness and judgment, 
um, Exodus 15, 12, it's a strong right hand that, um, um, that this is in the song of Moses, right? And so it's his right hand that's it's spread out and um, destroys the enemy. And then my favorite part of like this lesson of the organ is the pointing. And so I don't know what that looks like for you guys. So sorry if that's 3D coming at you. But when you're pointing, and I think of like the new moon, uh, because when we're out looking for the sliver, um, somebody will see it and we'll be like, where, where? And then they're pointing up in the sky. And usually what you have to do, because they're in a different perspective, like they may be over a, like a couple of feet from you and they can't see it where you're pointing. So I'll like bring, like I bring my daughter over, put her right in front of me and I'll point and I'll say, it's right, you know, like right straight up my arm, right where my finger's pointing. And then usually we can kind of gain that focus that focus in. And so, um, so I, it, it's, what are we pointing at? Because that's where our focus lies. And so that's just something. And then there's the whole, like in the picture I have on the slide, you know, if you're pointing at somebody, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. So be careful what you're pointing and wagging your finger about. Um, and it's also a month to watch our agreements, what we shake hands with and about. Um, are they in line with our vision? Are we making agreements and covenants um, that we should not be? So um, kind of pray into that. Um, the body parts that are connected to um, the right hand have are the large intestine and the heart. And that has to do with rejection, envy, sadness, confusion, and nightmares. So if you are having I would say pain in the large intestines and heart kind of thing, like well, one, see a doctor um, or, but just kind of pay attention to, are there any of these type of emotions that you are going through or holding on to that maybe need to um, be let go of? And so, um, or maybe you're having these emotions and not realizing how they're affecting you. Like maybe you know that you're dealing with um, rejection and, and not realizing that that's why you're having stomach issues. Um, Isaiah 41, I love this. It says, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corner. I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen and not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your L. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, Isaiah 41, 9 through 10. So we have lots of great verses for this month to meditate on. Spiritual warfare. The heat is being turned up this month. So is our vision getting blurry? Have you ever had that sweats in your eyes? And just maybe you're dehydrated and, and things. So um, we have to reset the mark if we're tired. Remember, sin um, is like sins an archery term for missing the mark, uh, Torah, Yara, it, like that, like those things um, have to do archery terms. There's a lot of those kind of things. So it's about missing the mark, um, a bullseye. Um, can we find rest in him to give you strength and renewal to keep walking on this journey? Um, and so the, um, the bullseye is not really a bullseye, but the sights I have um, on the slide uh, is very relevant to me because um, I have to, this, uh, actually this Saturday, the Sabbath, um, I have to uh, requalify for gun at work. And so our sites look like this, you know, similar to this. And um, we shoot a right, one of the guns that we shoot is a rifle and it can be kind of heavy, especially, you know, if you're kind of a, a you know, small female, um, it can be a little heavy. And what I always think about is when I'm shooting it, um, you know, you have it up and they say, if it starts getting heavy or tired, if you start shaking, take it down, rest your shoulders and then readjust. Like if your eyes, cause when you stare so long and you're waiting to, to get that, that sweet spot, I guess, whatever. Um, I'm no sniper. Believe me, I haven't shot in two years because our state's been out of ammo. <laughs> but um, so, you know, it's 
you're trying to focus and then your eyes just come out you're going cross-eyed and it gets blurry and you're like okay i need to stop and refocus and readjust um so this very much uh you know the whole idea of setting resetting the mark is very familiar to me um so don't be afraid to do that it's okay to say you know what i just need to I need to step away for a minute and I need to, to take a break. Maybe it's from a conversation. Um, maybe it's taken, um, you know, a Sabbath rest, an actual rest. You know, if you're part of an assembly, um, sometimes that can be um, very busy um, or a lot of stuff going on. If you're part of assembly, if you're doing the worship team or your prayer, prayer team, whatever it may be, um, maybe you just need to, to take a little break and just reconnect with the Father. Lev, um, who has authority over your heart? That's something to um, to remember, and that's the Hebrew letters. That's what um, that's what they uh, kind of um, indicate is who has authority over your heart. Lament, uh, the Lamed is authority. Maybe your authority is being challenged at home or work or ministry. Maybe there's grumbling and complaining in your camp. Weeping for Tammuz. Be careful not to fall in love with being a perpetual victim. You are called to be an overcomer. How? Obey one day at a time. That's part of Keisha's list. I'm going to read the rest in a second. Idolatry destroyed the first temple and sent them into exile. Are you in exile? And if you find yourself there, what are you doing? What are you doing about it? Um, what was the idolatry? Was it the fear? Was it the victim? mentality that she was talking about what have we made an idol in our life uh things that we wouldn't think of not money um you know not relationships not you know sometimes it can be those things like that becomes part of our identity well this is who i am i'm i'm the victim and that's i think that is probably more um we're more susceptible to that type of idolatry than we are to um to other, um, like what, like what we would normally think of as idolatry. So this is, um, on the PDF. If you go into graceandtora.net and it was just so good, I just couldn't not read it. So, um, if you go graceandtora.net under the month of Tammuz, this is the PDF that's, that's there. Um, part of her, uh, notes say warfare. And she says, um, Egypt must be pressed and sometimes even burned out of us. It's hard process and flesh hates to die, but this is a death unto life. May Adonai give your eyes to see that you are in a process and that there is great hope for your future. So she gives some bullet points here. One, focus, carefully consider, look for the authority and, um, and the authority over your heart. Offices of authority are challenged in the body, in the workplace, and secular government. Rebellions rise up in many forms, but especially against leadership. I don't know how many of you guys had voting um, in your um, states today, but we did here in Illinois, and we are in a battle in my state, um, and even in our country with um, decisions that have been made. Be mindful and cautious about grumbling and complaining and longing for the distorted normal of Egypt and Babylon. You are a peculiar people. Your normal is not their normal. Boiling and frothing lust, appetites and desires only lead to losing eternal things for a moment of earthly pleasure. May you live and not die. Do not grow impatient with the wilderness, his testing and trading, or in waiting for Yeshua's return. Impatient hearts always produce golden calves. Do not use this time to size up your neighbor. Doing so actually reveals that you consider yourself to be the judge or authority. You know that pointing finger? You're the judge and authority over them. Look at your neighbor with compassion and mercy and understanding. See their pain and struggle and love them. Guard your eyes. What are you watching, viewing, perceiving? What's coming through those gates, through those walls? Make sure Tammuz, golden calves, or other aisles are not your focus. Uh, tears blur your sight. Let them flow out. Cleanse your vision and release your burdens. Uh, don't allow tears of jealousy or selfishness to cloud or blur your vision. Know that God really does know and see your 
affliction and he does care. Trust that even in these things, he has purpose and can make all things new. Remember the breach in the walls of the temples, their destruction and why they were destroyed. Um, the first uh, temple was for idolatry and the second for baseless hatred between brothers. So let's not get caught up in either one of those. And finally, ladies, friends, um, we may feel the heat and squeezing of the beginning of the summer season already, but the one who provides the life-giving water will not let us wilt unto death. He wants to revive us and restore us. Check your heart. Is it getting hardened in your relationships from rejection? Can you hand over the fear and the doubt so that no idols will be created in that waiting space? Behold the son. He is standing at the gate um, of the sheepfold to bring you in for rest. Keep your eyes on him. He's calling out truth when the world is telling you you are not enough or you don't have enough. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Can we rest in saying, you, Yahweh, are all I have and you give me all I need. My future is in your hands. Fill Fill, filling up with adoration causes worship to pour out from our lips and we see despair flee. Sis, together our walls are stronger and our praises are louder. So we're walking this journey together. We're never alone. And I just pray that you would um, surround yourself. That's part of our hedge of protection, surrounding ourselves um, with each other so that we can be that protection when somebody needs to, oh, I don't know if Rhonda's on. Um, Rhonda had a beautiful vision of this and I don't, it's hers to share, but it was that. Sometimes there's some that, that need to go inside and be protected. And then when they're strong, they come out to the outer circle and they're that hedge of protection. So I just pray that I wanna be that for you. I want you to find that um, in others. And I know I have that in so many um, of the women around me. And so um, I'm just praying that um, for all of you right now, if you're hearing it live here tonight, if you're listening later, if you're listening in a year, two years, um, I'm just praying that you are surrounded um, with people who are praying and know that you are. I'm praying for you, praying for anyone who's, I was praying it right before I even went on tonight, for anybody who listens now or later that you would have that hedge of protection around you for whatever you're walking through. And when you're strong, you come out and the next one will go in. Hallelujah and amen. All right, ladies, you can unmute and chat as you would like. I've got about 15 minutes. Anyone, anyone?